This is a Security Weekly production. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly, Episode 1. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined on the lines via Skype by Mr. John Strand. Welcome, John. Hello. You mean you mean episode two hundred and one, right, Paul? No, I mean this is episode one. I was just oh telling the guys God. earlier, episode one of Security Weekly. I forgot to push record. We had to do it all over again. Episode one of Stogie Geeks. I forgot to push record, and we had to re-record it all over again. So I'm kind of maybe we're not recording right now. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of feel like it's good luck. You know, it's 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 the first episode. Wrap it in plastic and save it. It's just going to get worth more and more as time goes on. That's really. right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so just a quick introduction, since this is episode one, John and I are going to do this show weekly, and we're going to talk about enterprise security news, which is interesting. As I was looking at it this week, John, I have completely different news stories from the main Security Weekly show. I mean, it's totally different. There, but um, there's a lot going on, really, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I all realize the time. that this is a topic not many people are talking about, so we're not going to talk to you about data breaches. We're not going to talk about exploit kits. We're not going to talk about malware. We're going to talk about like what's happening in enterprise security solutions. And then we're going to delve into, so it'll be roughly the first 15 minutes. And then after that, we're going to delve into a topic and talk about enterprise security solutions in a particular area. For this first episode, we have chosen to talk about hunt teaming, which is something John and I are very familiar with. So, Yes, sir. And, you know, it's interesting, whenever we were talking about setting this up, this is stuff that we talk about anyway, like a lot of the enterprise level products that organizations can purchase. Do they work? Do they not work? What's happening out in the space? So it's kind of interesting whenever you're like, yeah, we should do another podcast on this because it doesn't quite fit with the security weekly mold. But I think that there's a lot of people that are interested in like what's happening in the enterprise class product space. Yeah, and as I've been teasing this show, uh, certainly people are like, oh, yeah, like I really – I would listen to a show about that. <laughs> so uh, cool. let's jump right into the news. I've got a couple of news articles here on FireEye. Um, so this new FireEye service evaluates uh, mergers and acquisitions and does risk assessments for mergers and acquisitions. So this is something that we've been doing for a while, um, and it, this is one of the more interesting things that we do at BHIS. It, it, it's very weird because if you have one company that's buying another company or you're talking about a merger in that particular situation, there's a lot of inherent risk in taking on that corporation. So doing background investigations on the key principal players is very, very important to do because if you have, let's say, three people that are in this company and this is like their 15th corporation that they bought, sold, and all those corporations had burned down and dramatically fashion, that would be a red flag. If you had somebody that has a history of embezzlement, embezzlement, fraud, maybe drug abuse, those types of things are generally not the type of security things that most people would look for. And then also, what's the security health of the organization? Do you purchase or merge with a company that has zero security? You go to Shodan and it comes up with Windows right. 2000 systems. All of that can impact prices. <laughs> well, FireEye is break, broken it down into four core areas, threat mm -hmm. detection and response, access controls, infrastructure security, and data safeguards which, I mean, are really general terms that speak to the effectiveness of a company's security program. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, okay, let's take let's just the first one, threat detection and response. If you're looking to merge, let's say it's a fairly large organization, and you have to drop an entire network operations center and a security operations center, that's going to really impact the bottom line, especially in the short term, which stockholders are so very interested in. So, no, I, I think that this is a great service. You know, it's kind of differentiating the security space, and it's very, very cool. And, you know, going through the different things, there are some other things that you should look to if you're actually getting into the M&A space. Like I said, what, what about background investigation? of the key principles, things yeah, of that like nature that. as well. I like that. Then we've got some interesting kind of uh, market news for FireEye. They say that um, their future is bright, but investors shouldn't avoid the stock. And I think we've seen some volatility in the, in the uh, stocks of these companies, which may not necessarily... Now, John, do you, I don't believe that it translates as to whether or not you should adopt a particular company's technology or not in most cases. I, I think it has absolutely nothing to do. I mean, you know, it's weird. You look at FireEye and um, their stock price went way up and now it's down and then it's going back up. It it doesn't seem to have much to do with, with what is actually happening with those companies. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of the same thing as breaches. We've talked about it on Security Weekly a number of times. 
And, you know, it seems like if a company gets breached, it doesn't really impact that company financially as far as stock goes. So I don't know if somebody would avoid investing in a corporation, especially a company like FireEye, if they have a little bit of a rough batch whenever it comes to stock value. But And, and that might not be a bad thing, too, because if, if FireEye all of a sudden decides to start doing things like capital investment research and they're investing back into the corporation, their total stock you know, value that goes back to their shareholders may go down. But that may be really good for the long term. So I don't see any correlation between these two. What's your thought? I don't either. I think uh, kind of one of some of the other things this article touches on is um, the acquisitions that FireEye has made. You know, they bought Mandiant back in December of 2013. They bought uh, Eyesight Security more recently. In 2014, they bought N Pulse. I'm not familiar with N Pulse. I don't know them either. Um, but I, I think it, between Eyesight and, and Mandiant, you know, they've certainly made some interesting and in what I think are good acquisitions in the market. And it also seems like talking with a number of our customers, it seems like they're actually utilizing those technologies and integrating them, um, not just technologies, but also the services, Absolutely. like Mandiant especially. I mean, that was mm. a no-brainer. Right, um, right. It's not like IBM or Cisco where they buy a product and then it just dies. It just seems to be very, <laughs> yeah. seems to be very they change complimentary. They the name and then they, they yeah. yeah, they like they do, like systematically kill it off in like these very well calculated steps, but. Fire doesn't seem to do that, which is great. Uh, Wait, where's the Where's the bunny, Lenny? Where's the bunny? <laughs> <laughs> Tripwire IP360 now discovers more than 110,000 conditions. And it's interesting, John. I put some articles in here, and I, I don't know if I come up with a name for it, but I do this on Security Weekly too. I'll put an article in sheerly for the title, and I, I don't need anything <laughs> but the title to talk about this. <laughs> This is weird because, uh, we, you know, once again, we know a lot of the people at Tripwire and they're good people. But this whole entire press release was written by somebody that is taking English as a second language, it appears. Um, <laughs> it's just very, very yeah, awkward. The, the new intern do the press yeah. release. Yeah. <laughs> the new intern and he failed English 101. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> but OK, so I got a question on this one, though, yeah. for you. Let's talk about coverage, vulnerability coverage. Well, um, it's an interesting it, subject. Thousand. I, I, tell me more about. I, I know that everybody should understand this is setting this up. Like, people. yeah. But tell uh, me more about coverage and CVE coverage and things like that. Obviously, full disclosure. I used to work for Tenable Network Security, and if you start looking at the coverage uh, between products, you start thinking about ways in which you can measure that coverage. And I think it's interesting, and I can kind of guess where they came up with the hundred and ten thousand conditions, right? So. Each plugin that looks for a vulnerability, a vulnerability is a condition. Now, I can say with certainty that they don't have, they don't find 110,000 vulnerabilities. In fact, what's the total CVE database? Is it about 86 or something? I thousand? thought it crossed 90, but I could be wrong. I think you're right. CVEdetails.com, is that the website, right? Uh, we're at 75,000 total CVEs uh, on the market today. So. What, what they're doing is they're also saying, well, we can audit for configuration. So uh, we have a configuration audit check for Microsoft systems. We have a configuration audit check for Apache systems. And each configuration item that they check is a condition that they can find. And, and well, that's that, how they're measuring it. In that case, that almost seems low. Um, if if you're if you're adding in configuration items, that almost seems like it's a, a lower number than it should be. Because I read this as, and correct me if I'm wrong, this almost you can almost correlate this back to plugins. It's almost like them saying we have 110,000 plugins, or um, is that incorrect? Well, and also a plugin can check for the vulnerability in varying degrees of uh, conditions too, right? So. Oh, I guess the moral of the story, right, if you're running an enterprise security program, is to be careful about when people make claims as to what those conditions are. It, choose the solution that's right for you. If, you know, you look into the product and you're like, wow, they work really great to uh, find vulnerabilities and do audits on Microsoft systems, but we're a huge Linux shop, then maybe that's not for you. So it's all about the areas that they focus on as well. It can also be some of the severities that they focus on. So you have to find the solution that's right for you and not, um, you know, don't pay too much attention to how many different plugins they have, how many different conditions 
uh, that they have because it's so, probably not going to help you that much. So kind of kind of on that note, I got a question. And mm. just also full disclosure, Tenable is not a sponsor of this particular show, I don't, right. I don't think. No, there is no so, one who is a sponsor of this particular show at this point in time. <laughs> yet, but we are actively looking for ways to whore ourselves out. Absolutely. Um, if you'd so, like to sponsor, please email paul at securityweekly.com. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, so, so here's a question. Is it fair to go to a vulnerability assessment scanner provider? Um, or vulnerability management provider and ask them specifically what plugins, what vulnerabilities they cover, for example, in SCADA or Linux or Windows? Or is it even, is it not cool to ask them for a full listing of the CVE coverage or their or their coverage for different technology yeah, no, products? In, uh, so some vendors, you can figure that out um, on your own, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because their, um, their feeds or their products are, are freely available and it contains much of the same uh, checks that uh, the commercial, you know, paid for products too. So uh, absolutely, you should ask. Uh, you should also do the investigation on your own as well. So, And, and then uh, one final question on this one, just got, it's something I've always wanted to ask you now mm -hmm. that you're you're kind of free. And, and Ron and, and the team and Renault and all those guys are still good friends of ours. But if you were on the other side of the table and you were a company that was looking into a vulnerability assessment scanner, what would be some of the questions that you would ask that would probably um, – give you the most information about how well a scanner would do for your organization or to be blunt, what questions would actually piss off the vulnerability scanner vendor uh, because you're asking a fairly blunt question. Um, you know, I think that John, one of the uh, key pieces of functionality for me that uh, in a vulnerability management system that I would look for is the ability to change the configuration or apply the patch or integrate with a vendor who can then basically when I find a vulnerability, go apply the patch for me. And I know it scares a lot of people, um, mm -hmm. but I think operationally it's somewhere we need to go. I think it's very much almost like a DevOps style yeah. um, uh, approach that we need to bring to vulnerability scanning. And, and that would be the question that I would ask them. And I, there's not too much headway being made now in that area across all the vulnerability uh, management platforms, but I hope that it goes that way because I'm a huge fan of that. But it's going to go that way. It, it has to, right? I mean, this isn't mm -hmm. 2003 anymore. Whenever you talk to companies, we do talk to some companies and they're like, well, we test our patches for three months, which is, which is total bull. Usually what they mean when they say they test it for three months, it means they wait three months until the day before the three month period is over. Right. Then they try to test it and get it in. But yeah, I, I think that's where it ultimately has well, to go. Actually. It, and I tell you what, this next word I have on uh, automating vulnerability scanning with Amazon Inspector has a lot of the vulnerability companies uh, a little a little nervous, I would say. Um, I don't think they're, you know, like totally freaked out, but it's kind of scary when the platform provider basically is giving people a tool to do vulnerability scanning. That's what Amazon Inspector is, um, is uh, it looks at your Amazon instances and does vulnerability scanning. Now, I don't think the coverage, it does talk about CVEs. I don't know what the coverage is on this particular platform. However, if you're deeply entrenched in AWS, this is something that you should test out. Absolutely. Well, I also think that there's more to it than just them trying to get in the vulnerability space. I think there's two main drivers for it. The first main driver that I think is really important is we have seen a number of people who implement products or services in the cloud and they just never look at security. They just assume that Amazon is handling all the security for them, which isn't necessarily always the case. So I think it's a way of trying to fix a perceived security problem that's in their product um, and basically saying, hey, we have a solution, it's free, you can run it. The other thing that I, I wanna get your opinion on is, Amazon has a lot of stuff like Kinesis and S3 and a number of different services that are very specific to Amazon. And honestly, underneath the hood, Amazon's the only one that knows how those things work. Mm -hmm. And do you think a lot of this has to do with the fact that, you know, they, they're, they're basically testing for vulnerabilities that maybe they would be the only people that would understand the impact of a misconfiguration or um, being able to adequately test it in a lab? I mean, if you're at Tenable or some other company, you can set up the service and set up the product in the lab. But with a lot of these things, it's in Amazon. You can't get the source code and just simply test it in, in, in your own lab. So yeah, Amazon's I mean, got to come up with a way of testing test it on their it in own. Your, test it in your own AWS environment um, mm -hmm. and, and see how it works is the best that you can do. Um, mm -hmm. I hope that it includes functionality that um, only Amazon can provide. 
uh-huh. because they're the ones that know how all these pieces of complaint. I mean, and John, you and I know, like, and Amazon, you've got like, there's like 800 services in the cloud and yeah. all of them are geared towards so that you build your application that relies on these tools so that you stay on Amazon forever and don't move and your application gets bigger and you pay more money to Amazon, right? I mean, that's their business model. So yeah. And I, it's a I good business would, model. It too. is a good business model for them. <laughs> absolutely. Great. Um, so, I mean, I hope this tool is really awesome. It's actually the news article is it's coming out of the uh, testing phase uh, and <laughs> is going to be generally available. So if you are using this tool, please let us know right in and um, tell us how you like it. No, it should be very cool. Um, uh, just so some, some funding news, John. Uh, Buckcrowd yeah. raises $15 million in Series B funding. Turns out there's big business in um, uh, leveraging a vetted community of more than 27,000 security researchers finding bugs. Yeah, and this is this is interesting. Um, I remember Katie, who was at Hacker One, and is starting her new uh, her new service here shortly. Um, we should get Katie on the show. We, we really should, should um, without question. Katie, Katie, I, I love Katie dearly, and Katie has said things that are very, very inflammatory from time to time, especially in the pen test community, mm -hmm. where she said, "Look." You guys that are doing traditional penetration tests, you guys aren't going to be able to keep up. If your goal in doing pen testing is simply finding, you know, some vulnerabilities and and uh, you know maybe running a scanner, those types of things, your days are extremely numbered. And the reason why is because of things like Hacker One and mm -hmm. Bug Crowd. So the way it works is you sign up for Bug Crowd, you become a security researcher, and they have open security assessments that you can do. And it's basically externally facing websites or services, and you can find vulnerabilities on them, and then you can notify someone that you found the vulnerabilities on the open challenges. Mm -hmm. After you've done that for a while, then they bring you into a second tier, and it becomes that you're a trusted security researcher at this point, and you can um, you can now gain access to companies and maybe do some internal stuff uh, or doing authenticated tests against some of these apps. So I, I think that this is interesting because this is going to fundamentally shift the way penetration testing looks for many organizations. However, I don't know if it's going to be a complete overhaul of the entire pen testing community. I, I don't know how many companies would actually be interested in having quote unquote random testers test their organization mm -hmm. on a regular and ongoing basis. But is it still, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> is it still just externally facing websites even at that I, second tier or do they get I, more I access? I'm not. I'm not exactly sure, but I think at the at once you get past that primary tier mm -hmm. as a tester, you do get access to internal sites at I that point. You. Once you have proven mm -hmm. yourself um, at that point. And what's weird is this actually follows a lot of the kind of black hat hacker marketplaces, right? The only way that you can be part of the black hat marketplaces is to actually prove in some fashion that mm -hmm. you're actually a black hat. And uh, once you got a certain level of proof, you get more and more access and more and more information to better and better yeah, exploits. I, mean, and things I that think nature. that... <clears throat> Having these essential blind tests that come from uh, this level of service, uh, bug bounty programs, I think is great because it doesn't it doesn't cost that much to put a program together, and you only pay when someone finds a bug. You know, mm -hmm. and it's different from penetration testing. Like, what if we only get paid if we found vulnerability? Well, I guess we'd still get paid, but so <laughs> sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, but most of the time we'd get paid, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. There would be those cases where it's tough, but. So I think if you have a large externally facing site, having that level of diversity um, across that testing, like Facebook, for example, I mean, it's one of the largest websites in the world, most subscribed to websites in the world, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. They have to have a bug bounty program. I mean, they can't possibly, uh, even if they had a team of people, to have those people all think outside the box and find all these weird vulnerabilities, um, even a company that's making a lot of money like Facebook, eh, it still doesn't make sense. Why not just outsource it? So I think in those circumstances, and you don't have to be as big as Facebook to take advantage of it, but I think in those cases, um, it, it really helps. Now, going to that second tier and letting them into internal websites, that's where I get kind of sketchy too, John. Yeah, and, and look at this funding. Uh, anytime you see anything above $10 million in funding, it means that it's serious funding. Right. Uh, years ago, whenever I was get, working at, at, at a defense contractor and doing VC stuff um, as an employee of the defense contractor, they wouldn't be interested in anything less than $10 million. Now, you do see some people funding out, you know, two, five million, mm -hmm. but the big boys and the big people that are in the water, once you start seeing 10, 15 million getting dropped in some of these startup companies, it means there's something serious there. And right. I do believe that there's something serious here. I mean, look at their profit 
kind of capability. I mean, for me and my pen testers, I have a stable of pen testers. I have to feed and water them, keep them insured, mm -hmm. keep them closed. And there's a lot of overhead that comes with that. Whenever you're dealing with bug crowd, you only pay out whenever you have something. Mm -hmm. And their overhead is extremely low and their potential for profits is very, very high. So, right. you know, if I was investing in a company, if this was to go public, this would be a company without question that I would I'd be I'd be jumping all well, over. Yeah, and here's the sentence right here. Bug crowd has experienced over two hundred percent bookings and revenue growth year over year with ten consecutive quarters of revenue growth. And so that's yeah, just I mean, they were prime they were primed to take in a second round of funding with that with those numbers. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just a really quick last thing in the news. Checkpoint uh, announced a, a strategic partnership with CyberX, um, which really this means that Checkpoint's going to make really resilient and rugged firewalls that you can put on like oil rigs and nuclear power plants, and they can be exposed to extreme heat and temperature and be dropped and stuff like that. That's really what I got out of this story, which I thought was kind of neat. And I, I, I think it's cool, right? It's, it's pushing down, you know, firewalls down to the endpoints and getting them out to some of those places where you can start having these systems be a little bit more self-protected. Um, that's one of the huge things in industrial, uh, kind of the industrial uh, ICS base is there's no security out in a lot of these things. And you can basically right. plug right in or mm -hmm. you can jump on a wireless network and just attack to your heart's content. I, I can't wait, though. I just can't wait until we find one of these on a pen test because uh, that's, <laughs> that's going right. to be cool stuff. Yeah, so they said the firewall, IPS, anti-malware, and sandboxing uh, inside of the SCADA networks, which uh, – Yeah, uh, just cool. huge. Because right now it's not in there, right? <laughs> and it's, it's just it's, it's just a it, it's just a Linksys wireless access point from two thousand nine, yeah. um, <laughs> which ironically enough is pretty resilient. <laughs> pretty resilient. Uh, so, John, our topic for today is threat hunting, and it's interesting I, when I I tell people on the full disclosure, John and I, we co-founded and co-own a company, and one of our products does threat hunting. Okay, just throwing <laughs> that out there. Which is why yep. we chose it for the first topic because we didn't really need to prepare much in all honesty. We're very busy. <laughs> so we said, you know what? Let's talk about threat hunting. But when I tell people, hey, you know, I, I co-founded Offensive Countermeasures and we have a product uh, that does threat hunting. They were like, what, what, what is threat hunting? So, John, what is threat hunting? So one of the things that we realized, just going back about two years now, uh, just by doing network penetration tests, is that a lot of the traditional security products that are out there today fail. Um, you can bypass any one of them, a uh, number of different techniques for bypassing things like Carbon Black, Bit9, different firewall vendors, Palo Altos, a lot of vendors that we like a lot. If you have a targeted attacker, they're going to bypass those technologies. Mm -hmm. So. Whenever you're doing threat hunting or hunt teaming, or there's all kinds of different yeah. names for this, right? Right. Hunt, hunt, hunt teaming is, is a popular term. Yep. <clears throat> and then there's a uh, breach or compromise assessments. Everyone's trying to trademark threat, the threat new name. A, is it threat analytics? Sometimes they try and talk about yep. threat. What's interesting is that I think that the sim market um, is looking to. They've always been trying to do this threat hunting, but they've been trying to do it by parsing through logs and events. And, and, I, and I think the interesting thing, and I don't want to burn out too much for what we're going to talk about on the sim stuff, mm. but I think that sims are approaching it in an incredibly wrong way. And they're in a position, many sims, um, that they can do an amazing job, but they honestly don't know. I honestly think that a lot of sim vendors don't know what they're doing. I know that people will be mad about that. But um, just as a quick little thing, uh, go to your sim, and this is setting up our sim our sim podcast that's coming up in a couple mm. of weeks, and see how many unique event IDs you collect. Then see how many of those unique event, event IDs actually have a signature written for them, that there's a, some type of processing associated with that specific event ID. And you're going to find out it's about 10 to 20 percent as it is. Hmm. So it's weird. We're collecting a lot more than we're actually looking at. Hmm. And this ties into threat hunting quite a bit because – your advanced attackers, by and large, can bypass these traditional security defenses. So threat hunting is basically going out and trying to find those advanced attackers in non-standard ways, um, not trying to just do AV checks, not trying to just look for your intrusion detection system, but looking at network traffic patterns and analysis, some of the things that we've got patents on now, and trying to look at the data in a different way. And more importantly, it really takes somebody with an attacker's background to do this effectively because they have a really good understanding about how beaconing works. They have a good idea about how lateral mm. movement works. Right. So threat hunting is huge. What it's going to get even bigger. What I love about threat hunting is I get to tell people, okay, take all your preventative measures and just ignore them for now. Take mm -hmm. all your measures of detection that are looking for attacks 
and vulnerabilities, right? Those are two separate things. Like, don't bother looking for the actual attack. Don't bother looking for the vulnerability. And take all of your technology that is looking for the malware itself in any way, shape, form, or fashion and throw that, don't throw out the window, but don't pay attention to that. You're only looking for when something has already been compromised and it communicates out. And I think that's what really separates threat hunting out in its own category. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have those other things. You should have those other things, believe me. But it's kind of interesting to focus on just, well, what happens when malware or some kind of exploit kit or some kind of custom payload has to communicate back out. And let's look for that. And it turns out that looking for that can be very fruitful. It can be. And it's also, it's, it's, it's a lot more interesting than waiting for the bright light to go off. Um, so two things, you know, you brought up two really good points. Number one, we're seeing a lot of vendors that are trying to put agents on every single endpoint. Um, and there are very, very few, very few uh, vendors that are actually good at that. Um, I think Dave Kennedy and team does a, does a really good job of it because they're a team of pen testers. That's what they do. But there's a lot of them. Like we collect every single API call. We collect every single process that starts. We collect every single process mutex. We collect all of it. We pull it back into a centralized centralized collector, and then we do analysis on it. And it becomes white noise. It becomes almost almost impossible to effectively find these advanced attacks because even oh, yeah. if an alert and, and does those pop- are the same uh, approaches and vendors that are saying they use um, uh, Elasticsearch and they use big data and they use <laughs> artificial intelligence to go yeah. through all of the, that data that you that you specified, uh, John, when really yeah. I, I don't I, – that – I mean, those there's a mixed bag in there that are taking that approach. I really think that – if you're looking well, for the right things in the right manner, uh, um, you can be very effective at finding stuff that's already been compromised in your environment. Well, and we're getting a, we're getting pretty good at understanding BS whenever it pops up. It's like if I'm talking to somebody and they're like, "Well, we're going to collect all this stuff," and then we use Elasticsearch. Well, then I know they don't either don't know what they're doing or they suck at it. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we started out using Elasticsearch mm-hmm. and we moved on. Uh, just because Elasticsearch doesn't scale that well, especially for structured data that mm-hmm. we're ingesting. Um, when we're talking about artificial, just today, actually, that said they did, yeah. they were using that. Yeah. Yep. Nope. Nope. That's not. Uh, we know exactly where Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch falls over right. and dies. Uh, mm-hmm. We we've got we we know exactly where that line is, mm-hmm. and uh, Elasticsearch just doesn't work. And uh, the other thing, though, whenever you're talking about it, is you talk about artificial intelligence, and we call ours AI Hunter is kind of a joke. It's not artificial intelligence. Um, it's just advanced intelligence or whatever the hell we want to call it. It's not I artificial you, you, intelligence. Advanced, inte- advanced intelligence. Yeah, so it's not decided on. Yeah. And the whole point of it is hunting is an active activity. Whether you're using a product or not is completely irrelevant, but you're actively going and looking for the attackers. It's not something that is just done for you, like a big bright red button that says you've been hacked. Now, if they pop up and they say, look, this is something you really want to look into because it's weird, I like that. That's great. But you're never going to see a product that pops up with detecting advanced attackers and says, hey, we've caught the attacker. They're right there. And it's very, very plain and simple because these guys are really good at hiding. And uh, it basically, it's tools to make you better at your job. Yeah, it's interesting, John. I was <clears throat> speaking with a Security Weekly guest on this topic a few weeks ago, and I, I realized in talking with him that um, when I worked for the university, I was doing threat hunting, and my only tool to do that was a Linux command line, some packet sniffers, maybe some NetFlow data, and I took some other logs from various places. But I basically used raw packet analysis coupled with NetFlow data to do threat hunting. And when I was at university, right, like it's hard to do security in a university. So I would just forget about all that other stuff for a while and just focus on, okay, let me find what's been compromised. Let's see where these are talking to. Or maybe I found a system that was compromised and I said, oh, it's communicating in that way. And then I would go analyze all the traffic on the network and look for that pattern. So it's not mm-hmm. an intrusion detection system, right? It's not a vulnerability. Like you're looking for a specific outgoing pattern. And I was doing it at the university. Lo and behold, I was doing threat hunting, and I just wasn't calling it threat hunting. I was calling it security. <laughs> yeah, it was, called, it was called work. Yeah, uh, you know, work, right? Yes. Hey, but, but look at how far we've fallen as an industry. Like a lot of people aren't allowed to do that, right? Mm. They, they, it's either an appliance or it's nothing. Companies are willing to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on appliances, but they're not willing to invest in their people. And they're not really willing to invest and products that make their people more effective. They want the bright, shiny red light. Um, Joel, uh, he's a 
security researcher out of Columbia University, mm -hmm. um, has done a number of different presentations. And, uh, you know, like what you're talking about doing is stuff that he's doing right now and has been doing for a long time out of Columbia. Mm. And he's given presentations on the topic. And it's interesting talking with Joel about it and talking with you. A lot of times whenever you give presentations on these topics, it's like, okay, we've got all these logs and then we use NetSed and we kicked out the packets and we did NetFlow analysis. And here's a set in Oxcript to basically parse the DNS packets from this weird product. And they do all these different things. People's eyes gloss over and they're like, mm, no, mm, not, not doing that. But yeah, the year, years ago when we were doing it, we had to do it that way. And, you know, trying to I do feel it like better. We're like, we're like old now. We're like, we yeah. walked to school both ways uphill in the snow with cardboard under our feet. And that's yeah, well, <laughs> must have been must have been nice to have cardboard. But now, um, <laughs> now all you fancy people have all these pretty graphs and pie charts and I, I love the ones that are, they give you like a network topology map that you can like <laughs> move around and stuff. It, yeah. And, and that's you can associated fly through with it. threat hunting. And that's where I feel like we're like the old curmudgeon are like, in my day, we wrote Perl scripts to do that. <laughs> yeah. And we didn't have the fancy GUIs. Um, I, and I, I thought did. I did. What was the, what was the product called? It was uh, IP, IP audit was the name uh -huh. of the product. And it would, it Excellent. was written in Perl by someone <laughs> who had worked for university and I, I, some people had extended it, and it, it, that's what I used to analyze NetFlow data. And it, it was Net awesome. It was awesome because I could, I could find compromised systems in NetFlow data that, like, no one could find on the desktop or no one the firewall guys, could, and no one else could find. But if I looked at the NetFlow data hard enough, I could find it. Yeah, and there was something I just saw on, da -da 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 -da, on darknet.org.uk, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a new network analysis um, network analysis tool uh, that kind of did that whole mapping of, uh, of the inside of the network. I'll have to hunt that out. But yeah, that's kind of the way it was. And I, you know, we don't want this podcast to be like, hey, a bunch of two old guys talking about old things. Um, <laughs> that's, that's but I, 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 now. And, I, and I think ultimately we have to remember, Paul, that in, in large part that sucked. Um, that was really it did, hard. You know, it really did suck. It I, I say that, but it crashed a lot <laughs> for a mm -hmm. lot of different reasons. Uh, if you tried to query too much data, <clears throat> it would just fall over. We have way better technology uh, today to be able to analyze, oh, yeah. you know, oh, all yeah. of this data that's coming through. But the the techniques are still very similar. So yeah, yeah, and and that's that's the big thing. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on uh, on Reddit, going through NetSec and pwned, and going through where attackers take over an organization and then walk through it like the hacky team or hacking team out of Italy, whenever mm -hmm. they got compromised, the attacker did a full write-up. I saw that. that. I read that. Yeah, we're going to talk about that on Security Weekly tonight. Yeah. Yeah, it, but if you look at the pivot techniques that he used, those are the same pivot techniques that attackers are using in your enterprise right now. Um, so there are some really cool automated tools. I don't want to be completely down on this. Um, talking about uh, hunt teaming and things like that. Mm -hmm. I really, really like uh, Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics. Uh, I yes. don't think you've had a chance to look at this. Have you gotten a chance to look at this in our lab yet? Or? I, I haven't. No, I've only read about it. So Yeah. So Microsoft Advanced Threat Analytics is just the bee's knees. It is fantastic. And it does it by watching logs, but doing it in a different sort of way. Mm. It watches your event logs, and it'll start to say, okay, well, Paul is logged into this workstation. And then all of a sudden, Paul is logged into 53 other workstations. Mm -hmm. That's weird. That's indication of lateral movement, and it'll notify you. Password spraying, um, you know, accessing number of different file shares. And all of that comes back to the, to the domain controller. When you set it up on a span port and on, your, uh, on the same network segment as your domain controller, and it watches the traffic, and it'll start alerting you to that type of lateral movement. And I think for most people, it's not that expensive because it's probably part of your Microsoft subscription right now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just one product. You know, This past year, we tell all of our customers. But I think that's great, John. Uh, it is really two different uh, ways that you can do the threat hunting, right? You can look for the outbound traffic, which is primarily what I was describing when I worked for the university. Oh, yeah. But if you start to detect lateral movement, that's another way that, you know, again, you're not looking for the signature of the malware. You're looking at the result of an attack. And sometimes that movement is lateral. Sometimes that movement is external. Typically, there's both, right? There has mm -hmm. to be some communication with the outside that you're looking for. But you can notice patterns on the inside uh, as well, 
So and uh, and Eric Conrad he talks about this. He says there's two golden rules of threat intelligence. He says number one, all malware wants to pivot or wants mm -hmm. to communicate back, and number two, it wants to move laterally. Mm -hmm. He says those are the two things. If you focus on those two things, you're going to be doing pretty good. Right. Yeah, and logs are an interesting place to to look for that, um, especially some of the user analytics. And I think the there are there's probably a whole other segment we'll do on the user analytics tools, um, which I I think provide the lowest false positive rate in terms of uh, detection as well. Um, mm -hmm. If you're looking at just the user behavior, like you described earlier, John, uh, that can be very fruitful uh, as well, but not 100% oh, yeah. accurate because. Not all the time do does activity that an attacker or malware or whatever is doing is associated with the user behavior, right? It could be oh, 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 outside oh. of that scope of the user, so you can't just rely on one or the other. Dude, and that's a great point. There was a news story that came out uh, this week mm -hmm. where point-of-sale terminal malware is was communicating outbound command and control over DNS. And you know we've been using DNS, DNS Cat 2 from Ron mm -hmm. Bose for years in our assessments. And a lot of organizations, we, you know, even with really good security postures and egress filtering, um, you blow right through the door with something like DNS Cat 2 because it's, it basically does all of its command and control in well-formed DNS requests mm -hmm. and uh, just makes it out. And it was nice that we finally had this happen. I mean, I don't like breaches to occur so much, but it's nice because a number of our customers, whenever we would use these techniques to get out of the environment, would say, yeah, but we don't see that as a real attack. And now we have some some examples of that. But you're right. That point of sale terminal itself, yeah, it's not a user. Uh, just basically the bad guy got on that point of sale terminal. They set up the back door to exfiltrate the credit card data off, right. and they're using DNS to do it. So you really need to have both. You need to have good network forensics mm -hmm. um, at the edge of your network, what's leaving your environment. And you need to have something on the inside to look at that user behavior analytics as well. I love all the terminology. And just as one segment, we talk about hunt teaming threat, hunting, uh, we talked about, uh, we mentioned threat intelligence in there. We mentioned threat analytics, network intelligence. It's just, it, in this show, it's interesting how, uh, it, well, it's actually a goal for this is to cut through a lot of those terms and define what they mean and really talk about what you need in your security program to be effective to defend uh, against uh, the attackers. So. Well, and, th and this and this show is very different because at Security Weekly, we would just move really fast. Um, we would assume that the people know about those types of things. Right, right. And we tend to roll our eyes at vendors. We tend not to talk much about vendors. And I think you and I both have came to the realization in the past couple of years, uh, mainly the past couple of months when we started talking about the show, mm. is we can't ignore the vendor space. For right. the longest time, we would say, oh, I could do it on my own. Give me a command prompt. Give me some Python. Get, you know, get Perl. And <laughs> I can do all this on my own. And that's just not the way it is. And we really don't want to be those old curmudgeons right. uh, still talking about Pearl well, because and, we need to talk about the enterprise space. And the other thing, too, um, and this is not so much relevant to threat hunting, we're kind of getting off topic, but this is fine, um, is, you know, we'll evaluate uh, vendors. And sometimes some people on the team will be like, you read their website for about 10 minutes and you don't want to look at them again. I'm like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's, you know, yeah. <laughs> sometimes well, they're just indicators that I, I just, I, 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 I don't know. Uh, we, John and I are very critical of vendors. Um, we always have been. And, and to speak to what we want to accomplish on the show, I mean, that's what we want to bring together here without flaming anyone or hurt anyone's feelings, obviously, but essentially gonna talking, happen. well, it's going to happen. <laughs> oh, we're going to talk yep. about solutions that work. We're going to try not to focus on solutions so much that, that don't work. It's yeah, like and my approach, and, same approach in my cigar podcast. When we review cigars. The ones that I don't like so much, I tend not to talk about. <laughs> True. And I think that's the best thing. If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything right. at all. It usually we, we would, we, well, we're, we're getting older and we're getting better about that. Right. Um, but when though, I look at threat hunting, John, I mean, you mentioned the agent approach. And, and this is one where, like, I'll research a company that's doing some next generation threat analytics, APT detection, and then it requires them to install an agent. And I think we could probably have a whole show on on agents. Like, what what agents do you install? In it? Like, I've got an endpoint protection agent, and I've got an antivirus agent, and I've got a vulnerability management agent, and I've got a privileged account management agent, and I've got a threat analytics agent. Like, how many agents can I have on my system? And well, so and when it comes down to threat hunting, I'm like, if if all it's doing is is just threat hunting, 
how does that really work, right? Well, and I want to talk a little bit about Binary. Uh, once again, they're not a sponsor of the mm -hmm. show. Uh, but Kennedy's company at Binary is very, very good at doing these types of things. And they can, they can use agents, and they cannot. They can inject into – they can work with your existing SIM solution. And the, the reason why they work and the reason why they work very well is – Dave and his team know, and you know, Mick Douglas is at that team as well. He, they know what the hell they're looking for. Mm. Um, it's not like, okay. So one of the problems with a lot of these agent based solutions is the people that are designing them don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, they don't even know what a real attack looks like. So right. they log everything. Mm -hmm. It goes back to that white noise. So we're just going to log absolutely everything. Cause God damn it. We don't know if we're trying to detect something, if it's going to be able to detect it or not. And it just becomes worthless. Whereas if you approach it from the perspective of, I know exactly what I'm going to look for. I'm going to look for these particular types of things because this is the way attacks work. Then you have something that's going to be a lot more effective. But it requires that background and that knowledge to know what the attacks actually look like to be effective in the first place. Right. Anything else on threat hunting? I'm sure it's a topic that we'll uh, come around uh, and talk about again, obviously, and, and, and maybe delve a little more into the topic. But I thought it was a good general overview. Um, it, yeah. You know, I... So how tall do you need to be to ride the ride, John? Is threat hunting for everyone or? No, it's, it's absolutely not for, for, for absolutely everyone. You do have to have some understanding of network protocols. You have to have an understanding of how network connections actually look. Um, you have to have some understanding of what a beacon looks like. You have to have an understanding of what normal things look like in an environment. Like what does Dropbox right. beaconing look like? And, We're and using so Skype. Are, those are technical things to do threat hunting, but what about uh, in terms of your security program? Like where on the maturity curve of a security program do you need to be to take advantage of threat hunting? Oh, oh, okay. Well, that depends on what you're going to do. If you're going to try to go the agent approach and mm -hmm. you're going to do threat hunting, um, then you have to have operating system se uh, security and forensics backgrounds, and you're going to need that anyway. Whereas if you're looking at the edge of your network, um, it tends to make that glass a little bit clearer mm -hmm. um, as far as what's leaving your environment. You generally don't need to be crazy mature because a lot of these products can just in can, they can plug right into a spam port, mirror port, or they can be inline, or they can be off a tab off of what's leaving your environment and they can do that type of analytics for you right out right. of the box so i mean it, so, yeah, it doesn't matter how advanced your patch management your vulnerability management your no. firewalls ips is right i mean this is is uh, a technology that most can adopt and hmm. um i will say that you're gonna need some kind of incident response program to follow up <laughs> mm -hmm. so uh, well, at the bare minimum, <laughs> and if you don't have that it, it's it's going to force you to create one because it's going to find stuff there that's you compromised, go. right? Yeah, I, I was about to say mm. that right there. You know, if you don't have it, you're going to need it really quick. And if you right. if you don't have it, you're mm. going to build it really quick. Right. And that's right. all okay. That's all part of learning. Yeah. So that's cool. So you can be really short. That's good. <laughs> Nothing really wrong short. with vertically challenged. <laughs> Nothing. No. Not that you and I have ever had that problem, but, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, so you can find all of the show notes um, on our wiki website, wiki.securityweekly.com. Uh, very shortly, you will find uh, the section for Enterprise uh, Security Weekly there. We'll likely uh, drop this into the main feed uh, for now to gain some exposure, and you will be able to subscribe to just this show, both audio and video, separately coming up as well. So there's a lot of things in the background that will be happening. Uh, in support of the show, so you can always go to securityweekly.com and subscribe. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. John, thanks for doing episode one. Very exciting. And look for Our more episodes in the future. That concludes this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. <laughs>